I've entitled our message, all right, it's working, want to get away. Um, quick snapshot of our psalm uh, this evening is David complains about his enemies in general in this uh, um, personal lament. And so it's a little bit general, but it's, it's called a personal one because there's somebody specific uh, that was doing something in his life. And, and so it's about also about a specific enemy who, uh, who David thought he was his friend, would call him friend. Matter of fact, one of his closest friends. And then he expresses confidence of being delivered from his enemies and then their destruction and then resolves with putting his trust in the Lord. And so he's going to take us on kind of that road uh, uh, as we go through this, this psalm. I think David went from singing, remember Simba and the Lion King? I just can't wait to be king. You know, he had to wait 10 years, right? Where, where uh, Samuel had anointed him with oil and he's waiting and waiting and Saul's still king and he was told he was going to be king, but he's still not king yet. And so I was kind of picturing the song of uh, maybe whistling that, I just can't wait to be king, to end up, end up singing, it's not easy to be me, if you're familiar with Five for Fighting with the song Superman, where he says, I'm only a man in a funny red sheet, and it's not easy, it's not easy, it's not easy to be me. And uh, just realizing how with privileges that we get come great burdens and responsibilities. So he has the privilege to be the king of Israel, hand-selected by God himself, but that comes with a lot of burdens and it comes with a lot of responsibilities. God's enemies became David's enemies Leadership is not easy. And so I picked this title, title Want to Get Away, from one of our main verses, but we'll, we'll bring down the lights just for a minute because uh, this is just to kind of remind us of where this came from. Get away. Okay. Now you can. Southwest had the greatest Check this out. With, these. with this controller, your character will mimic your exact motions. See? Sweet. Now throw me a pitch, just like we're outside. Want to get away? Okay, so you get now the you can. That's what I was thinking of when, uh, because in one of the places, it's just like, that, that's David. He just wants to get away from everything that is happening there. It's G. Cam G. Campbell Morgan that said, fear leads only to desire to flee. Fury only emphasizes the consciousness of the wrong, and faith alone creates courage. And so we're going to use G. Campbell Morgan's, uh, uh, basically his outline there of those three F, fear, fury, and faith are going to walk us through these three sections of this, uh, of this chapter. And so let's read our, our first one from verse 1 through 8. We're in Psalm 55, 1 through 8. To the choir master with stringed instruments, a masculine of David. He starts off, David, unto the Lord, give ear to my prayer, O God, and hide not yourself from my plea for mercy. Attend to me and answer me. I am restless in my complaint and I moan because of the noise of the enemy, because of the oppression of the wicked, for they drop trouble upon me. And in anger, they bear a grudge against me. Or that word grudge there can liter literally means to, uh, to hate. They hate me. My heart is in anguish within me. The terrors of death have fallen upon me. Fear and trembling come upon me and horror overwhelms me. And I say, oh, that I had wings like a dove. I would fly away and be at rest. Yes, I would wander far away. I would lodge in the wilderness. Selah. I would hurry to find a shelter from the raging wind and tempest. Whether it was troubles around him or terrors within him or treachery next to him, it all just made David want to get away. Now, for me, it's, it's and hope, I'm sure it is for you also, it's very comforting to know that some of the spiritual giants of the scriptures dealt with the same thing. Wanting to get away. It's just like, I don't want to do this anymore. 
I just want to go away where nobody knows me and nobody, you know, whatever is happening in, in that person's life. Happened to Elijah and he ended up succumbing to it. That was with, in 1 Kings 19 where Je- he heard Jezebel was on, uh, you know, was after him and he was going to, you know, she was going to kill him and, and he just runs as fast as he can out in the middle of the desert, you know, and so he, he takes off and, and so he wanted to run away and that's exactly what he did. Jeremiah, on the other hand, withstood it. He felt it in Jeremiah 10, 19. The desire was there. I just want to run away. I just want to fly away. But he didn't do it. We always have that choice. Tonight, I wonder how loud is the noise of the enemy in your ears? That, that's what he's saying there. Is uh, kind of an interesting phrase there in verse, in verse 3. Because of the noise of the enemy. That sometimes, that's all you can hear. You can't hear the Spirit. You can't hear what God's trying to say. You're reading Scripture. You're not hearing from that either because the noise of the enemy is, is so loud. Maybe you're experiencing that. And so in verse 6, he, he just wants to take the wings of a dove and just, I'm out of here. Maybe that's what he's picturing. Maybe, the, maybe he's seeing them on the side of the cliffs and they're just all by themselves and, and no one's bugging them. And, and, you know, and, and, and so he just wants to fly away. Just wants to get away from it all. A time to escape. Remember as little kids, you ever run away? You pack a little bag and you went and stood on the street corner or whatever and you come back after 10 minutes because you got hungry or whatever. I think we've all done it, you know, someplace, but it's, it's packing our bags and just going. I've had enough. Can't take any more. And what we hear from this and why I say I love the Psalms is because they remind me I'm normal when I'm thinking of these things. I'm just like these guys. And they struggle with it and I struggle with it. They're normal. All of these emotions are normal but not great solutions to our problems. To run away, does that help? Or to escape, whether it be with alcohol, with drugs, whatever else, to be able to escape for a time. Some do it just binge watching for three hours on TV and just, just to get away from the world and just to get lost in somebody else's world or somebody else's problems that are awesome because they always resolve at the 30 minute mark or the hour mark, right? In any TV show that you watch, it's like, okay. Except for 24, remember that? That never resolved. That, that was, you had to binge watch that. So many songs, I don't know why, so many songs were just flying through my head. You know, Steve Miller Band, I want to fly like an eagle to the sea, fly like an eagle, let my spirit carry me, or Twisted Sister, we're not going to take it anymore. You know, whatever your genre was, uh, whatever. But David wants uh, these, these wings, he, he wanted wings like a dove so he could fly away from the storm. But what he really needed were wings like an eagle so he could fly above the storm. Warren Wiersbe came up with that and I think it was brilliant. Not to fly away from whatever storm you find yourself in, but how about the wings of the eagle to get, get up above it, to be able to ascend and go up. Reminds us of that Isaiah 40, 31, so popular. They who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. You can't fly beyond the storm. Because... You, you get beyond that storm. You run away from this situation, and what do you find? Same situation somewhere else. You try to run from this relationship, and then you realize, and, and then you run from that relationship, and then you find out eventually, hopefully, if you have any type of emotional intellect, the, the intelligence, that, that you realize, wait a minute, I'm the common denominator here. I'm the one that are blowing up these relationships. It wasn't her, it wasn't him, it wasn't that situation there. It was me. And so it's not about flying away from the storm, getting out of this problem here, because it's just going to follow you. But again, be able to fly above the storm. And so God permits the burdens you face today. These are definitely burdens that David is facing in his life. But God permits the burdens you face today to help you win your wings, claim your wings from him today. What do you mean, Brian? How, how, do, how do we claim our wings? What, what do we mean by that? Well, when you call on the Lord, we're going to see that a little bit later in verse 16, and cast your burdens on the Lord, we'll see that a little bit later in verse 22, that's when he enables you to overcome. When we look up, when we, when we kind of get buoyed in life again, and all of a sudden we can settle down, see it clearly, and ultimately we trust in the Lord. And so the fears, all of those fears, I just want to get away. Then the, the next section in 9 through 15 is fury. That's our next word. 
I kept wanting to call it the F word, but that sounds weird. But uh, so let me read 9 through uh, 15. He says, destroy, O Lord, divide their tongues. Maybe like uh, Babel from Genesis. For I see violence and strife in the city. Day and night they go around it on its walls. And so when David was around, it isn't the size of the walls that Jerusalem has today, uh, but there was a wall around that. That's how you would protect it. And so what he's envisioning in here, and maybe it was these seven sins that he names here in verse 9 and 10 and 11 uh, that are kind of personified on walking on the walls. It's these sins that are lurking and, and on the walls and in the city. That, I think that's where he's going with this. So again, verse 9, destroy, O Lord. Divide their tongues. For I see violence and strife in the city. Day and night they go around it on its walls. And iniquity and trouble are within it. Ruin is in its midst. Oppression and fraud do not depart from its marketplace. It goes on to say in verse 12, For it's not an enemy who taunts me. Then I could bear it. It's not an adversary who deals insolently with me. Then I could hide from him. But it is you, a man, a man, my equal, my companion, my familiar friend. We used to take sweet counsel together within God's house. We walked in the throng. Let death steal over them. Let them go down to Sheol alive. May they go to hell alive. For evil is in their dwelling place and in their heart. Well, some of the Psalms are... Lord, I just want to break their cheekbones. I want to do this. I want to do that. At least it's part of his prayer. He's asking God to do it. So that's good. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. And so I'll just roll the vengeance over to him and ask God, could you take care of my my enemy? We don't know who he's talking about here in verses 12 through 15. It could be a son's Absalom's rebellion where David, the king, while king, has to flee, has to leave with some of his guys where his son takes over and tries to raise himself up to be king. Could have been Absalom. And it could have been Ahithophel, which was one of his best friends, one of his great commanders. And when that took place, he left David and stayed with and went with Absalom. And it just crushed him. And he talks about it a few different places in, in, uh, for Samuel, but also we have it here. And so we're we're not sure. Could have been Absalom that he's talking about. Could have been Hithophel. What he's saying is, you know, when an enemy attacks you, uh, you kind of expect that. They're your enemy. But when it's a best friend, when it's somebody that close, somebody that lives in the same house with you, somebody that close. and, And maybe he doesn't tell us who it is because it just doesn't matter. We don't need the name. We need the description because we've all faced that before. Somebody so close to us in our family or a best friend that has done that to us and maybe even we've done it to somebody close to us. It's trials when someone you really love betrays you. Somebody said it takes a, well it's true, it takes a diamond to cut a diamond. And sometimes our friends can hurt us so deeply but again, and other times we deeply hurt them kind of reaches its pinnacle of his hurt here in verse 15 where he says, let them go down to Sheol alive. That Sheol, sometimes that Hebrew word is to go down to the grave. Other times it's representative of, of hell or death. David wants his enemy to not just experience death, but the pain of the evil that they have inflicted. inflicted. He wants them to live where only death resides. We compare that uh, David's cry to the son of David, Jesus' cry in Mark 14, verse 20 and 21. It's at the Last Supper and uh, has to do with Judas. And Jesus said, it's it's, it's one of the 12, one who is dipping bread in the dish with me. For the son of man goes, as is written of him, he's going to do exactly what his father wants him to do. But woe to that man by whom the son of man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had never been born. Such. He's kind of saying the same thing. as David is saying here. He will get what is coming to him. 
We have evening and morning and all day, all noon. Verse 17. Oh, I didn't read all the way down. No, I just have it in the wrong spot here. Um, Let me say one last thing about fury, sorry, and then I'll get to the next one. I just had a, a thing out of whack there. When we're talking about fur- f- fury, is all fury wrong? Like, can we be furious over something? Putin, Russia, what's happening in that? Is all fury wrong? No. But in our fury, we satisfy it either in our own strength, where we'll yell or scream or get a lawyer, or... We have God handle it. And of course, that's where we're going in the psalm towards the proper way to, uh, to, to handle this. And so we move to our last one and we look at uh, our third word here, our word faith, and we'll pick it up in verse 16. Notice 16 starts with the word but. But I call to God. Right after that, that, that moving from his fears of what's going to happen to this fury of, Lord, take out all of my enemies. And he, he pauses here in verse 16, or it shifts into third gear. But I call to God, and the Lord will save me. Evening and morning and at noon, I utter my complaint and moan, and he hears my voice. He redeems my soul in safety from the battle that I wage. For many are arrayed against me. Verse 19, God will give ear and humble them. He who is enthroned from of old, Selah. Because they do not change and do not fear God. My companion stretched out his hand. He goes kind of back to talking about them. My companion stretched out his hand against his friends. He violated his covenant. His speech was smooth as butter, yet war was in his heart. It was flattering, but destructive. Then he says it uh, another way. His words were softer than oil, and yet they were drawn swords. Then he gets to the long view in verse 22. Cast your burden on the Lord. And he will sustain you. The message said it this way, Message Bible. Pile your troubles on God's shoulders. He'll carry your load. He'll help you out. And he'll never permit the righteous to be moved. The end of verse 22. Verse 23. But you, O Lord, will cast them down into the pit of destruction. Men of uh, blood and treachery shall not live out half their days. But I... We'll trust in you. I think what I would grab out of this is just these three statements in 16, 22, and 23. 16, but I call to God, cast your burden on the Lord, but I will trust in you. Really incredible of what, where he ends up in all of this. But I call to God. The wind that blows down everything is the same wind that lifts that eagle that we were talking about earlier. Same wind, same storm, different. In verse 22, cast your burden. I thought it was interesting that the Hebrew word for burden literally means what he has given, what, what he has given you. The thought seems to be this. Take back to God and cast upon him the burden he has laid on you. And he'll sustain you under it. For he is giving it to you to bring you to himself. You and I, we get faced with a burden. We immediately want to blame Satan. We want to blame the world. We want to blame uh, Biden. We want to blame somebody. And forget that so many of the times these burdens that are coming our way, I would say most of the time are from him. Again, purposeful. It's something that he wants to develop in us. He wants to mature us and cause us to, to grow. In Psalm 107, it's a psalm that Kind of tells the same story, but four different illustrations saying the same thing. And so I'm going to read just from verse 23 through 30. It says, Some went down to the ships in the sea, doing business on the great waters. They saw the deeds of the Lord, his wondrous works in the deep, for he commanded and raised the stormy wind. So you picture being out on a ship out in the middle of the, the Mediterranean, which is most likely what the writer's talking about here. And they find these big swells coming up. He commanded and raised the stormy wind, God did, which lifted up the waves of the sea. They mounted up to the heaven. They went down to the depths. 
Their courage melted away in their evil plight. They reeled and staggered like drunken men and were at their wit's end. And then it says this, and this is the kind of the chorus that comes up all four times through this, this psalm. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble. Trouble that God brought. He brought the big waves where they were up here and way down to the bottom. He's getting them seasick. He's doing all of that. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble. And he delivered them from their distress. He made the storm be still or calm. And the waves of the sea were hushed. And then they were glad that the waters were quiet. And he brought them to their desired haven. He, he, brought, he brought the ship into that haven of rest. They were, got into the, where it's in protected waters now and they're safe. That's what happens when we cast our burdens upon him. Cast your burdens on the Lord. Which is an interesting phrase that David's telling us here. Oh, so believers do have burdens. We shouldn't be shocked when burdens come our way then. We should be reminded that most likely coming from God. They're not accidents. They're appointments. That's how we should see them. They're appointments. I have an appointment today for this burden. What am I supposed to learn from it? How do I, how do I handle this responsibly and seek him? And so rather than wait for God to take the initiative and remove these burdens that are troubling our hearts... We're to take responsibility of casting our burdens, casting our cares, casting our anxieties upon him. He's given us something to do, not just waiting for him to fix it, but in the meanwhile, here's what I'm supposed to do in the middle of those burdens that are flying at me. Throw yourself on the mercy and care of God. Again, this is a decisive action on our part. It's not passive. It's not partial. It's something that we need to do. Casting our care on him. Letting him relieve the weight. Whenever I'm traveling through airports, I always have my backpack with me. The reason I have my backpack with me, and it's a very heavy backpack, is because I always have my camera gear on the bottom. And so however I pack, that's what I have, and that's what I have with me. And it starts messing with my neck. I had a C6, C7 disectomy back in 2006, and so I have to be careful of what I put on my back. I can only go so far. And, and so anyways, it's after going through airports, and you're there, and it's just on your back for all of that time. But you hit those moving sidewalks, right? And uh, you get those in some of the bigger airports. And I can, I'll, I'll usually assess how long it is, but if it's a long one, I'll take it off and let it on the floor. I can do it either way. I can continue to bear the burden of the weight of that, or I can place it down next to me at my feet where it's touching my foot, where I can feel the thing so somebody didn't come try and rip it off from me. But in the midst of that, this moving sidewalk can bear the weight of it, or I can continue to bear the weight of it. It's a choice. It's always a choice. Of course, Peter chimes in and says, the famous one that we're talking about here, casting, and I think he stole it from the psalmist here, right? Casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. The old King James, new King James, cast your cares on him because he cares for you. But is that, it is two different Greek words and that's why the newer translations changed it. Casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. And so whether you worry or don't worry, whether you have anxiety or hold on to your burdens or cast them off, it's the Lord who must care for you. Listen to this. Jesus is willing to be fully responsible for the things that we're anxious about, worried about, or burdened about. He's saying, please, please, let me bear the weight. Let me take that from you. Let me take that heavy pack pack from you. Remember the first time I hiked into Burma, I just thought about that with, uh, you guys have met Dave Eubanks before with the Free Burman Rangers, and it was a three-day hike in, and I was just spent, I was just gone. And we had these, I don't know, 50-pound packs on, and, and I remember Dave, I had just met, that, that's where I met him, uh, it was through a friend uh, named Steve, and so we get there, and so I met him before and everything else, and here's this 
perfectly fit army ranger. We're the same age and everything else. I don't look like him. And he's, he's ripped. And, and, and so he says, here, let me take that from you. And it's like, no, 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 I got it, Dave. No, no problem, man. And he says, come on, just give it. And so finally he just grabs it and yanks it off of me. And I'm, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> you know, inside. And it's like, I could still handle it because we were getting close to where we were starting to get to. But with that, it just, re- I just remember just kind of floating the rest of the way down the trail in that way, getting that burden off of me. And that's the Lord begging you and begging me, give it to me. I will take care of every one of them that you continue to place upon my shoulders. Or your choice, keep it yourself, handle it yourself. Every time, let's remember that. In verse 23, as he starts wrapping up here and he says, but I trust in you. Let me put the emphasis on the word I. But I trust in you. Again, that choice it's David's choice has been made in the midst of this whole psalm that we've laid out here. No longer is he preoccupied with his enemy. There are only two parties involved at the very end of this psalm. God and himself. And that, so let's, let's pick up from this. Let's, let's learn from this. That's, that's what these psalms are, are placed here for. It's, it's David and his God. That's, that's where he doesn't, doesn't even see the enemies anymore. He's not trying to fly away like a dove anymore. He's facing it and dealing with it. God's taken that burden off of him. And, but with that, it's I, but I trust in the Lord. Emphatic. <clears throat> David taught us in times of uh, a trial, we can take one of three uh, approaches here. We can flee. That was verses one through eight. We can fight 9 through 15, our enemies. And we can fly above our trials, 16 through 23. David looked at his feelings in verse 1 through 8, what he was personally going through, crying out to the Lord in that way. Then he focused on his foes, 9 through 15. But then he focused on his faith in the Lord. Not his faith in his faith, his faith in the Lord. Beautiful. The song also, I see it relating uh, to Jesus in in many ways, but I'll wrap up with these these three. Jesus was the one hated without cause. So whatever David was experiencing here, the son of David, Jesus himself in the New Testament, uh, where in, in verse three it says, in anger they bear a grudge against me. Yes, he was hated. Jesus was the one hated without cause. Secondly, Jesus was the one who could have escaped his troubles, Right? Cast yourself down from the cross, you know, come down from the cross, show everybody who you, he, if anybody, he could have, but he did not. Oh, that I had wings like a dove, I, I would fly away and be at rest. He had that opportunity all the way up to and through the cross. Thirdly, Jesus is the one betrayed by his companion, Judas. In verse 13, my compa- companion, and my familiar friend. That it's the night before, uh, the night before Good Friday, and, and there they are having communion of all things. He's, you know, having the Lord's Supper. They're having their Passover meal, which he's going to convert to the Lord's Supper. And there's Judas sitting at the table, and there isn't any of the 11 guys that have picked up on anything. Judas sitting at the table with them, served with them for three years. As many commentators believe, probably did miracles right alongside them, doing all these different things that all the rest of them do. They had no absolute clue in doing this. My companion and my familiar friend. Jesus was the one betrayed by his companion. Let's pray. Father, we, uh, once again, I just say thank you so much for these psalms. Thank you that we realize our our lives are pretty normal when it comes to our Christianity, things that we go through, issues, enemies, problems, burdens, anxieties, cares, things that just feel so crushing and a weight that we can't hold up anymore. Oh God, I pray that you would remind us of David in this psalm, be able to take off our backpacks of burdens and allow you to carry them for us as you're asking for. Thank you. Thank you for being willing to do that. That not only do you save us by your grace, but we need your grace every single day of our sanctification. 
We need your grace all the way to glory. We need your mercy. We thank you, God, that you promise us the book of Lamentations. Your mercies are new every morning. And so, Lord, even if we used up our mercies today, it's going to be fresh and new right in the morning. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you. Amen.